Hi, good morning. Happy Monday. May the 4th be with you all. Um, so we're so excited to welcome Chris Onstott of Chronic Moskowitz Tiedman and Gerard. So uh, Chris, you're here to talk about five employment law pointers to know as we shelter in place and a few more when we go back to work. Um, really quickly about Chris. Uh, Chris is actually on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce. He is in his third year as a board member. Uh, and Chris, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started and talk a little bit about your um, history with Chronic Moskowitz Tiedman and Gerard, which is a mouthful, by the way. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, anybody that's listening right now, I encourage you to ask questions in the question box, and I will make sure to get those to Chris. So without further ado, Mr. Onsot, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Um, like, like Kevin said, my name is Chris Onstott. I have been on the board of directors for about two and a half years now. Um, I practice in, in Roseville and in Sacramento. Um, I'm an attorney. I do a lot of employment law, all on the management side. Um, and Kevin and, and Wendy asked me to speak a little bit just about different things um employment related things associated with COVID-19 and some of the emergency laws that went into place um so we're gonna speak a little bit first about uh, actually quite a bit about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act um you, you'll be familiar with a, a few things particularly the emergency paid sick leave and emergency family and medical leave um Families First, uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was passed um, on March 18th, 2020. Um, it, the, the two things that are, are most important for you to know are the Emergency Paid Sick Leave and Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. Um, there's, there's several other provisions of the law. You'll wanna at least be generally familiar with them, but these two, we are seeing more and more employees um, have questions about, or employers have questions about these. Um, for example, one of the things that is coming up a lot right now, as we're in the second month, uh, a little past the second month of our shelter in place, is um, employees coming to their employer and asking, hey, I've got three kids at home. I have exhausted all the child care that I have from family and friends. Um, my my usual child care place is not open. What can I do now? Um, and there's some certain things, certain benefits in the emergency laws that, that can help employees out in this regard. And, and there are credits available to employers um, for some of these leaves. Let's talk first about emergency paid sick leave. Um, covered employees are those with 500 or less, em covered employers are those with 500 or less employees. Um, one of the tips that I would give you is be very familiar with this emergency, reg the, these emergency um, laws. Um, Full-time employees receive, can receive up to 80 hours of paid sick leave for a qualifying event, while part-time employees receive paid sick leave in an amount based on the average number of hours worked over a two-week period. Um, the pay you can receive for emergency paid sick leave is calculated at the employee's regular rate of pay or minimum wage, whichever is greater. What are the qualifying reasons for emergency paid sick leave? Um, one, the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, two, um, they're paid at the regular rate, capped at $511 a day or 51.10 um, per employee um, total. The employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. Um, that again is capped at $511 per day or $5,110 per employee. Um, the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis. Again, this is paid at the regular rate, capped again at $511 a day or $5,110 per employee for the um, entire time that they're on this paid sick leave. Most of your employees don't reach these caps, so you wanna look at their regular rate. Um, 
these are paid at the regular rate subject to these caps that we just just talked about we're going to talk in a second about what it means to be subject to a federal state or local quarantine or isolation order as you know most of the state of california is in fact subject to a shelter in place in fact everybody that's not a critical infrastructure essential business is subject to such an order right now but there are very large exceptions in the way that the um, agencies have been interpreting this law and we'll, we'll talk about those in a second um, here's a few other qualifying reasons the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an order as described in section one or has been advised um, as described in section two what, what this means is they are um, caring for someone that's subject to a, to a quarantine order or they're caring for someone who's been uh, um, ordered to self-quarantine due, due to COVID-19 um, concerns. Here's the one that is happening more and more often now. The employee is caring for a son and daughter, son or daughter if school or the place of child care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 precautions. This one is the one that I'm seeing a lot, is we have a parent working, they're working from home, let's say, and it just becomes, they have three or four kids, um, some of the children are young, and they're like, I can't do both right now. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the other one is the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health. Uh, of health we we haven't seen that one as much keep in mind that on these qualifying reasons on this slide you're paid at two-thirds your regular rate of pay um or two hundred dollars that that is capped at two hundred dollars a day or two thousand dollars total per employee again this is um subject to that 80 hour limit that we talked about earlier um finally um Here's some other qualifying reasons. We're going to talk a little bit about the DOL temporary um, regulations and how they're interpreting this law. Um, what does it mean to be subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19? The DOL temporary regulations said that quarantine or isolation orders include a broad range of governmental orders, including orders that advise some or all citizens to shelter in place, stay at home, quarantine, or otherwise restrict mobility. However, and this is the big exception here, an employee subject to one or of those orders may not take paid sick leave where the employer does not have work for the employee. And, and they provide an example. For example, if a coffee shop closes temporarily or indefinitely due to COVID-19, there would no longer be work for those employees and that employee would not be qualified for paid sick leave for emergency paid sick leave under that event because the thought is there's no work for that employee to do this analysis um, the, the the regulations provide that this analysis holds even if the closure of the coffee shop was substantially caused by stay-at-home order uh, think about a, th a movie theater Movie theater closes because the governor is telling us, hey, we all got a shelter in place right now. You're someone that's manning the front front, front position of that movie theater. Um, you're, you're taking tickets or you're, you're getting popcorn. You're furloughed because the movie theater is no longer having showing movies. That employee is not qualified. It does not qualify for paid sick leave there um remedy is is unemployment um for example the the regulation says this analysis holds even if the closure of the coffee shop was substantially caused by a stay of at home order similarly if the order forced the coffee shop to close the reason for the cashier being unable to work would be because the coffee shop was subject to the order not because the cashier him or herself was subject to the order talk a, a little bit about some of the FAQs um, let's let's skip to the next one this is a FAQ that the um, the the DOL put out the Department of Labor it says 
If my employer closes my work site on or after April 1st, 2020, the effective date of this law, but before I go out on leave, can I get paid sick leave and or expanded family and medical leave? The answer again was no. If your employee closes after the FFCRA's effective date, you will not get paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave, but you may be eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. This is true whether your employer closes your work site for lack of business or because it was required to pursuant um, to federal, state, or local directive. Again, the, the idea is we're not going to give you paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave when there's no work for you to do. This was intended, that, that's unemployment. This was intended for people either sick with COVID um, or had some issue happen where they do not have access to child care, even though their employer remains open. Um, it says, uh, next FAQ, if my employer is open but furloughs me on or after April 1st, 2020, can I receive paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave? Again, the answer was no. Um, if your employer furloughs you because it does not have enough work or business for you, you are not entitled to take paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave. However, you may be um, eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. Let's talk a lot about emergency family and medical leave, the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. I'm getting a lot of questions on this right now. And one of the reasons is, like I said, there is a huge strain on employees trying to juggle working from home and also having children um, at home, most of whom are out of school now and are receiving assignments at home. Um, several employees are having this issue where they just don't have access to adequate childcare right now. Again, the covered employers under this expanded family and medical leave act are employers with less than 500 employees. Um, all employees, by the way, just a caveat on this, Governor Newsom um, expanded paid sick leave under questionable authority, in my view, um, to employers in the, food, in, in the food service industries who have more than um, 500 employ, employees. We'll be, I'll be interested to see um, if legislative action ratifies that or if someone decides to challenge that. It's an interesting thing that a governor might be able to um, order employers to provide paid sick leave in that instance. Usually that would be a law. We'll see what the courts do with that. Um, covered employers, all employers who have been employed by the employer for at least 30 calendar days. Because this law is designed to work in conjunction with the paid sick leave law, the first 10 days of emergency family and medical leave may be unpaid. However, employees may elect to substitute paid time off, such as vacation, personal, or sick leave. See the previous discussion during this time. After the first 10 days of emergency family and medical leave, the law pays eligible employees at two thirds the employee's regular rate of pay for the number of hours the employee would regularly be scheduled, regularly be scheduled to work for up to 12 weeks. Um, the emergency family and medical leave pay will not exceed, again, it's capped at $200 a day or $10,000 in the aggregate. So this is designed to give in addition to the two weeks of paid sick leave, 10 additional weeks of paid at two thirds regular rate for people who find themselves without access to childcare and are in a situation where their employer wants them to work but they are unable to because their ch children are out of school at home trying to learn from home and they find that they're not able to um, either go into work or, or provide um, the services that they're requested. Keep in mind a couple of things under this law. One, um, it applies only to, to employers with less than 500 employees. And, and two, it, it is subject to those caps. Also very important, if you have an employee who during the time period has already taken their 12 weeks of family and medical leave, they may have already exhausted their, their ability to get um, FMLA leave. Since this is an expansion of that act, 
they may not qualify and you'll want to contact counsel or someone else to, to talk about that further. But there are instances in which employees who've already exhausted all their family and medical leave do not qualify because they already exhausted it previous to this um, COVID-19 um, shelter in place. Qualifying reasons for emergency family medical leave, an employee may take up to 12 weeks of job protected leave to allow the employee who is unable to work or telework to care for the employer's child um, under the age of 18 if the child's school or place of care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to, public, to a public health emergency with respect to COVID-19. Um, Employees are entitled to reinstatement to the same or equivalent position following emergency family and medical leave. However, if following the period of the employee's emergency family and medical leave, the employer employs fewer than 25 people and the employee's position no longer exists due to the economic conditions or other changes in the employer's operation that affect the employment and are caused by the public health crisis, the employee is not entitled to reinstatement to the same or, or equivalent position. This, think small office. They have a small office, person goes out on this FMLA leave um, for, for these qualifying reasons. We have 25 or fewer people. We simply, in the COVID-19 crisis, we reduce headcount. Um, accordingly, this person may not have a job protection when they come back. Um, however, if the employer cannot restore the employee to the same or equivalent position following this leave, the employer will make reasonable efforts to contact the employee and restate the, reinstate the employee if an equivalent position becomes available one year after the public health emergency or 12 weeks after commencement of the emergency family and medical leave, whichever is earlier. Let's talk very briefly about the CARES Act and then we're gonna be moving on from this section. Um, everyone knows this provision, it was called the PPP. It allows um, emergency relief loans with a certain amount of forgiveness. Um, you, you should be contacting your bank and working through this with qualified counsel. I just wanted to let you know it's out there. There was some limited amount of funds that were reauthorized after businesses blew through the, the first part. This is the controversial part of the act, uh, of the CARES Act that, that allowed numerous businesses to get loans, some of which were of questionable qualifications as, as you may have heard in the news. Um, there's several provisions of the CARES Act. We'll talk about those later. Um, but I just wanted to let, uh, or we, we, we won't talk about those later, but I wanted to let you know to go look through that act to see if there's any um, help to your business. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you should be doing while you're sheltering from home, a few of the other tips. So we have the first tip is, is you know, make sure you're up to date on recent legislation. Another important thing is to check with your workers' compensation carrier about the impact of working from home. Um, you, you may not think about this, but if someone's injured on the job and they just happen to be working from home, um, that could qualify as a workers' compensation injury. Um, a couple things that you might consider doing to help alleviate some of the risk of this, you might consider making the employee have a defined work area from home. Uh, you, you might, look and see how that work area um, is set up, risks of injuries. You might take some effort to make sure that that work area is ergonomic. Um, you, you, you may also consider having set hours of work. Um, one of the things that, as you might imagine, becomes a temptation is someone claims that they were hurt working from home when really they were out on an errand doing yard work, other things. Um, you can at least try to limit that a little bit for non-exempt employees by making sure they have a set schedule. Um, and you should also make sure you have a standardized reporting practice and it's updated for your employees when they're working from home. Um, another big tip for work from home people um, is to avoid timekeeping issues. 
just because everybody's sheltering in place and working from home doesn't mean the um, labor California Labor Commissioner is going to go easy on you with respect to timekeeping breaks and and meal breaks. In fact, I suspect there's going to be a wave of litigation following this with employees who are out of a job who were able to work from home for a few um, weeks before being laid off, claiming all of a sudden, oh, you know, I was required to work mountains of overtime um, and or I without being paid or I was required to forego all my rest breaks and my lunch breaks. Um, make sure you're keep clearly defining your timekeeping requirements that you're keeping up to speed on them each day. Um, you should be providing documentation concerning meal and rest breaks for non-exempt employees. What's a non-exempt employee? An employee that's on an hourly pay rate. Um, you, you should be doing this for a couple of reasons. Um, there is an old case now, it used to be a new case, now it's becoming old, called Brinker versus Hanbon. And what that case was, is a California Supreme Court case that said employers need not ensure their employees are taking their meal and rest breaks, they just need to be providing them. In, in other words, that case held that employers couldn't force their employees to take meal or rest breaks, but they needed to be making sure that they were doing everything in their power to make sure their employee was being provided the opportunity to take them. Um, your employee handbook, email reminders, other things reminding your employees to take these breaks can go a long way to um, helping alleviate liability. Um, make sure you have something in writing saying, hey, just a reminder, you're required to be um, taking your meal break at this time. Your rest breaks need to be taken during this time period. Um, you also need to be staying on top of unauthorized overtime. Um, this is a very unique circumstance. You may um, notice that an employee is logged into their computer um, much longer than an eight hour day would be. You need to be following up on those things and making sure that that employee is not working unauthorized overtime. Um, what's your remedy? If an employee works on authorized overtime, well, let me tell you what it's not. You still need to pay that employee for that unauthorized overtime. It's not sufficient to say, well, I didn't authorize it, therefore I'm not going to pay you. You pay them for the unauthorized overtime, and then it's a disciplinary matter. You decide whether you're going to discipline your employee through either a suspension, up to and including even a termination, if they continue to work on authorized overtime. What you can't do is not pay them for that unauthorized overtime. Um, you need to maintain a set of schedule for your employees um, and require them to be responsive. Um, if you have a non-exempt employee that you have a schedule of 8 a.m. to let's say 3 p.m., um, it's reasonable that you, re you can require them, hey, when I call you or email you, I want you to be responsive to those calls or email. It's just as if you were working um, in your desk at work, just because you're home, you still need to be responsive. Um, finally, another tip, make sure you're taking confidentiality safeguards. Um, employee systems can become your vulnerability. Um, set up tech inter intervention if you recognize problems. Make sure you're real good friends with your IT person right now. Um, as they're trying to manage everybody working from home, to the extent you have um, firewalls and other things, make sure your tech person is in contact with employees and making sure that they're not vulnerable to ransomware, um, to other types of viruses that may um, become a bigger issue with so many people working from home. Finally, you need to be reminding your employees of their confidentiality requirements. And it's, it's harder when you're working from home but they shouldn't be leaving out sensitive documents on their desk. They shouldn't be um, emailing through their personal email account sensitive documents, things like that. Google's great, but when you're using Google, there are issues with, with um, security sometimes. So you need to be making sure that you, your employees are obeying the appropriate safeguards. Finally, let's talk a little bit about heading back to work. What are some things that you should be doing when you're heading back to work? Well, one, 
you should check with your workers' compensation carrier. Um, uh, and, and the reason I say that is when people are heading back to work, um, one of the things that all of a sudden becomes a real risk is contracting COVID-19 as everybody is no longer um, social distancing to the extent that they were previously. You may want to check with both your liability and your workers' compensation carrier to see if they have any requirements, any suggestions. You want to be working in lockstep with them so they're not turning around and saying, oh, you know, you didn't implement all the things we told you you should be doing, or we're going to think about not covering you here. You should be working with them on a plan so when people do come back into the workspace, um, you're adequately protecting people. Office space, not the movie. Um, let's talk a little bit about whether you're going to need to reconfigure your office for social distancing. When people in, initially come back to work, do you, do you need so many offices? Should you be having a schedule where only half of your employees are showing up each day at first? Um, maybe do an A and B schedule, something to allow greater amounts of social distancing. Um, one of the things that can be a real problem is let's say we have everybody come back to the office and two weeks later, we notice that there's three or four infections. Um, you wanna make sure that you can point to a series of documentation and make sure that people, um, that you can say, no, 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 we, we took all these precautions before allowing our workers to come back and here's what they were and here's who recommended them and we did everything we could. Um, are you gonna do temperature checks? Are you gonna um, have access to, what's your access to testing when people come back? How often are you gonna, are you gonna have um, people get tested? Do you need to have people get tested? Um, also, and this is really important, oftentimes we do all these great temperature checks, we do testing access, things like that, but we don't plan for, and this is likely, I wouldn't even say um, possible, but likely to happen at some point in the next year and a half, you are going to have someone test positive for COVID-19. And you're gonna discover that they were asymptomatic and that they were in your office for, this, for a week or two. What is your plan? Uh, a couple of, of tips um, regarding what, what you should be doing. If someone tests positive, you need to think, Okay, who has that person been in contact with? Do we have a record of where they were located, who they contacted? Who do we need to notify to stamp this out so we don't have to close the entire business again? Um, those are a couple of the things. And with that, we're right at the half hour. I said we'd, we'd finish up at about a half an hour. I'm gonna throw it open for questions. Kevin, you still there? I am. Let me pop back up here. Um, so, yeah, I actually did have a question. Let me um, share my webcam so people can see me. So I'm not just a, a voice here. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I have a question here. So if as a company, your employees don't typically qualify for FMLA uh, because of your company size, are they still eligible for the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act? They sure are. They are. I mean, there are some exceptions. There's some um, certain medical medical um, and healthcare um, businesses weren't included in it. But for the most part, um, it's anyone with 500 or less employees. That's different than the usual FMLA. And thank you for bringing that up. Under the usual FMLA and the California equivalent called the California Family Rights Act, the CFRA, you needed to have at least 50 employees, and those employees needed to um, work within a 75 mile out radius of each other for you to be eligible to take FMLA leave. Under the Expansion Act, that does not apply. If you have 500 or less employees, um, then you, you likely qualify. Now, there is a small exception to this that I haven't seen anyone take advantage of yet, but technically, the act gave um, the government the ability to exempt um, certain businesses with fewer than 50 employer employees. If the employer employed fewer than 50, the leave was requested, uh, or the absence of the employees requesting sick leave or expanded family and medical leave would entail a substantial risk to the financial health 
or operational capabilities of the small business because of their specialized skills, knowledge of the business or responsibilities, et cetera. And there was not sufficient, or there were not sufficient workers who were able, willing and qualified to do their jobs, then there is the possibility of an exception. Be careful, make sure you're talking with legal counsel before utilizing that exception, but there is the possibility of an exception if you have less than 50 employees. Perfect, and then I have another question here. Um, so does an employer need to hold a position open, and if so, for how long if the employee isn't comfortable returning to work after the stay-at-home order has been lifted? Well, here's the question, and I, I guess my question is, um, what's the reason for returning to work? We, we just went over the expanded family and medical leave. If they were out on expanded family and medical leave, you need to go through um, that process of, hey, you know, we have your position open again. Here, here's, um, we want you to come back and fill it, or hey, it's not open. Um, we're going to let you know when something does open. But otherwise, if it's just, hey, the governor's lifted their order and we're asking employees to come back and you have an employee that says, hey, I'm not comfortable coming back to work right now. I'm aware of nothing that protects that employee's job in that circumstance. Um, if, if you want, I'd like to double check on that. Um, you know, that is one thing that's actually really um, going to be an interesting issue is what happens when the employee says, you know what, I know you're back up and running and, and you're asking us to come back into work, but I'm good working from home. I liked it here and I'm not comfortable coming in. You're going to want to um, at least engage with that employee to see if there's some reason that justifies them not wanting to come in. And then you'll probably, if, if it's a qualifying disability type of reason, want to enter into that old interactive process that we've talked about earlier. Um, but that's something you should certainly be talking with counsel about because there may be instances where you say, you know what, we're open for business. You don't have a disability. You don't have any reason for not coming in other than the general fear that everybody has in coming in. Um, we're going to require you to come in and you're going to be insubordinate if you don't. Um, that's something certainly before making a job related action such as a termination, you're going to want to seek counsel on from an attorney. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And then um, another question just came in. Are there tax benefits for an employer employers as they comply with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act? I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm not a tax attorney, so I can't tell you what kind of documentation you need to be keeping. But yes, um, under the FFCRA, and I had meant to cover that, and thank you for reminding me, under the FFCRA, for both paid sick leave and the expanded family and medical leave, there is a dollar for dollar tax credit so long as you comply with the provisions and keep the adequate documentation. Like I said, I'm not a tax attorney, so you're going to need to either talk with your um, tax attorney or, or your, your CPA as to what kind of documentation you need to be keeping to get that tax credit. But yes, there are some tax benefits for providing it. Uh, so, Chris, where do you see, um, just in general, I mean, um, when we all do go back to work and the workforce, I mean, what do you see that kind of looking like in certain like office spacing, for instance? I mean, I can see right now that you're in your office. I mean, what do you see that looking like when we go back to work? I think it's really going to depend on what kind of work you have. Um, for example, if you're a packing plant, such as a fruit packing plant or something like that, um, you're going to have really different um, spacing than if you're in an office building. I think you're going to see um, a move, there had been previously a move towards much more open offices um, where people work close together in collaboration. I think you're going to see a little less of that right now. I think you're going to see more barriers um, to people, um, perhaps having certain teams apart from other teams. So if someone becomes infected, they don't infect everybody. Um, I also see one of the things is I think you're going to see a lot of people slowly going back to work. I don't think you're going to have, okay, we're open for business, everybody come back. I think a lot of businesses are going to do trial runs where they have a third or half of their employees come back. They socially distance them. 
they test the protocols um, so they don't get hit um, with a new wave uh, of the of infections and have to close up again. Um, now, Chris, what do you suggest, or do you have any suggestions um, in regards to um, just like I, I use the Chamber of Commerce office, for example, we're all socially distanced. We're all six feet, if not more away from each other. I mean, so um, just in your opinion, again, I know that you can't give, you know, you can't tell people what to do or how to run their company, but um, what do you have advice for people like our office, for instance, who are already socially distanced? I mean, do you feel it's safe to go back to work if we're already in compliance with that? Boy, I have no idea. Uh, on, on, <laughs> on whether it's safe to go back to work, I'm not a medical professional. Um, I would say this for your industry, whatever you, whether you're in office or things like that, there's going to be a premium placed on hygiene of the office. Um, and you're going to need to make sure that common spaces are, there's some sort of program for wiping those down, for disinfecting doorknobs. For um, one of the things that offices are looking at more and more right now, um, how can we minimize? areas where people are touching frequently and other people are touching frequently, such as if you have a keypad on a door. Well, does that door need to have a keypad on it? Can we do some sort of swipe um, with a card just to minimize the areas that people, uh, multiple people are touching um, in close proximity to each other? The other thing that I think you're going to see a lot of offices doing um, is really enforcing social distancing. Um, the office hugger, so to speak, is going to be out of luck. Um, they should have been out of luck earlier, but but now um, they are going to be really out of luck because you're going to need to remind people, hey, we are socially distancing at least until this is passed, and so please, you know, keep your space from other people. And then I have one uh, final question. Uh, can an employee take unemployment concurrently with these leaves if they are only furloughed part-time? You know what, that's a question um, for the unemployment insurance office. I, I have heard different things on that. Um, I can tell you that um, by and large, you're not allowed to take full unemployment and these leaves at the same time. Um, but that's really something you should talk to the um, EDD about who manages um, unemployment for the state of California. I know that there are um, instances in which you can have employees on reduced leaves and um, or on reduced hours and they be qualified for unemployment insurance. So that, that's certainly something to contact your unemployment insurance carrier or have counsel look at, but off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I would suspect you can't double dip, but the question I think is a little more nuanced because it's saying, hey, I'm on a reduced schedule now, and now I, you know, let's say I have a childcare issue or something like that. Um, that's something that, that you're gonna wanna work closely with, your, with, with the EDD on. Fantastic. Well, Chris, I wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, I know you're a busy guy, so we really appreciate it. I also want to give a shout out too, because we had some partners uh, that helped make this webinar possible and promoting it. Um, the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, Rockland Area Chamber of Commerce, and then the Loomis Basin Chamber of Commerce. So uh, thank you to those three uh, neighboring chambers as well. And uh, the four of us hope to partner more in the future and uh, bring you more just um, webinars like this that are really helpful. Now, Chris, um, before we let you go, can you just give yourself a plug and let people know how they can get in touch with you if they have more questions? Well, um, let me just rewind here. That's the Perfect. easiest way to get in touch with me. That's my Sacramento address. I'm actually in Roseville today. We're at 3400 Douglas Boulevard, Suite 200. Um, but dial the number or send an email. Um, I would um, like to thank everybody I noticed um, Kevin's in a t-shirt right now. I guarantee you I'm wearing cargo shorts <laughs> and this is a Zoom. Um, so, um, it, it's not just any t-shirt. It's a Star Wars t-shirt for the holiday oh, today. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, just just let me know if anyone has any questions. If I can answer it on the top, off the top of my head, I'm happy to answer people's questions. Um, be careful right now because mm -hmm. um, 
in the past it has been, hey, common sense is punished in California um, with respect to California employment laws. That's especially the case right now. There's things that you look at laws and then you go look at the regulatory guidance on how these are being interpreted from an emergency standpoint. Um, you really want to read the laws and the regulatory guidance. You can't just base your business actions off something you heard or reading part of things. Go and read everything and make sure you're fully educating yourself before you take action on some of these things. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much, Chris Onstott, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to him on the email or the telephone number below. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for this information, valuable information really is. And um, have a great rest of your week. You too. Uh, have a great week. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.